you know, who your demographics are is a mystery to you, but like the consumers need to know everything. Now, I know you've got a nice little case study about your own clients where one of you that I think you mentioned to me when we discussed this episode, about 70% of his business was on Amazon. And Ladles and jelly spoons, boys and grills. Welcome back to the 10 K Collective podcast for six and seven figure Amazon sellers. Now, of course, if you're an Amazon seller, you're not just an Amazon seller, you're an e-commerce seller. You may actually, crazy idea, be selling on your own store. A lot of people that I work with are. So, however, they are often very successful on Amazon, but struggle to optimize their own store. And not, they're not the only people that struggle to optimize their own store. People who are only on direct to consumer sites also struggle. So we have help here. We've got an expert, Chase Clymer, the co-founder of Electric Eye with us. Electric Eye creates Shopify-powered sales machines from their sites. They have strategic design approach and they develop, they, they have really intelligent development decisions. I'm butchering their, their pitch, but you get the idea. He's also the host fine. of Honest E-commerce, a weekly podcast with honest advice to increase sales and grow their businesses. Whew, that was quite the math. <laughs> Welcome back, Chase. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So optimizing existing store. First question then is I'm kind of a bit selfishly thinking about my clients, all of whom I think sell on Amazon that I can think of. Otherwise they wouldn't be part of the groups I run because I'm an Amazon specialist, but many of them sell on Shopify, sometimes quite significant or their own direct to consumer site. Let's just agree Shopify stands for direct to consumer, right? Yeah. Can we be good at both is the first question or is that even? I think what you're asking is like, do unicorns exist? And the answer is no. I think that it's definitely a bit of, a learned skill set, like you can understand the basics of, you know, building a Shopify website and how those marketing funnels work versus, you know, and, and what we're really talking about here is like a marketplace versus like an owned website where you have, you can control all decisions and you technically own the customer, right? And I think that you can have a working knowledge of each, but if you're really looking to scale these different businesses, it's a really a unique mindset. It's not necessarily in a, in a sense that like you can't learn it. It's just like it is a lot of stuff to know. So if you're really good at scaling or building a brand on Amazon and you want to go over to Shopify, you're probably going to be in for a rude awakening and a big learning curve. And, you know, do I think you can eventually get there? Possibly. Do I think it's worth your time? Maybe not. Especially if you already have a successful business, you know that time is money. Like you could probably invest in hiring a head of e-commerce or something like that, that can run that side of the business. So where I'm kind of getting to with this is most brands I know that are in the eight figures plus range that have both a Shopify kind of store and an Amazon store as well, they have someone in charge of each division. So they have a head of Amazon and a head of e-commerce. Interesting. Yeah. So in other words, what you're saying, I suppose, is to put it simply, a business can be good at both, but an individual head of each is needed. So you can't have one person who's good at both. Is that Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. And that's, yeah, yeah. you know, when you're, when people are out there trying to scale their businesses and they're hire, they're always looking to hire for a unicorn. I need someone to do my paid ads <laughs> and my email marketing. It's like, you're just going to have a bad time. Like once you get to a certain point, that is enough work for like a full-time job. So you should possibly, you know, think about it is if you're going to go down this this rabbit hole and you really want to start optimizing your direct consumer experience, that's going to take a lot of this individual's time, either the founder or your hire to learn these things, to test these things, to understand the nuances of the platform. That in and in of itself is a whole kind of skill set. So like it, if we're talking about a Shopify website, the nuances of Shopify, what isn't isn't possible within their platform versus Magento versus WooCommerce. Those are three different specialties in and of the, the subset of an owned business, right? Then the the nuances of eBay versus Amazon, right? Those are crazy different. And to understand oh, yeah. that takes skill and just reps in the game. So yeah. When you say that, and when you just say eBay and Amazon in one breath like that, because I don't know much about eBay selling, but one of the mastermind members has a background with that. I think he still does a bit, but it, God, they feel like different worlds to me. Whereas they Shopify, are. WooCommerce and Magento don't feel so different because I don't have that, that strong background in DC, but exactly. But they, they yeah. are, they are so fundamentally different with yeah. other than the fact that they can sell things. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and here's the thing, the bodega on the corner can sell me milk and so can Walmart, but I think they both have different operations. 
Yes, you make a very good point. I guess it's like we, we referenced in the first episode that the, the back stage, if you like, I suppose I was thinking front stage, backstage from my performing days as a musician, but the backstage financials of a business can be violently different to what you see on the front end. I like my competitors are selling X for Y price. Yeah, but they may have completely different finances, like a crazy amount of loans to throw at it or something. And I guess what you're saying is operationally a, a website or a selling some mechanism can, can be violently different on the back end. Okay. So what, let's just deal with some of the reality checks. And so let, let me take a few case studies from my own clients again, selfishly to try and help the people that I'm most involved with helping. So one of the businesses that I work with did about, let's say about $10 million in, in the pandemic year. So whatever the exchange rate ends up being just, just shy of that of which it was about 1.5 million was private label and the rest was reselling stuff. Now that was on Amazon. That was a really, well, for the business as a whole, they had a nice profit margin. It turns out their own consumer, direct consumer site was basically breaking even. Now, um, obviously it's hard to diagnose without looking at the details, but was that because they were just reselling other people's stuff that didn't have a strong enough brand? Or would you suspect that that's a split focus or how, what sort of patterns do you see in situations like that? So I would ask a bunch of questions like first, it's like, you know, what's the product mix, right? Of reseller stuff versus private label stuff, right? And then dive in to be like, cool, the conversation we're having isn't about your $10 million business. It's about this $1.5 million subset of your business. That's the opportunity. That's the starting point, right? And it's like, what's your margin on just that? What were you, your costs for acquisition for just that? What was the growth for just that? How much energy did you invest in just that, right? And if it's like, if they're like, we kind of just made our store, threw the products on there and called it a day and did one and a half million dollars, I'd be like, whoa, we're onto something here. This is, that's crazy, actually, what you just said, because you weren't paying to acquire a customer and you were organically getting sales on the site, which means your customers are seeking out this product in a place that isn't Amazon. So then you're on something cool and it's like, well, you should probably talk about and, and kind of getting into this. Whereas if they, you know, were something else here, I'd be like, is your entire catalog also on this Shopify store? So like the brand seems insane. So it's like, oh, it's not just a t-shirt brand. It's also a coffee filter brand and it's selling these weird Chinese lights. Like what, you know, that you got to start to simplify if you're going to build your own sh direct consumer store on whatever platform, we're just defaulting calling it Shopify on this one. And you're approaching it with the same mentality of a marketplace. Like you're, you're already making it harder on yourself to win trust because that just makes it look scammy. So, you know, for this one, if their, if their products did 1.5 million without much effort, I would probably say it's like worth focusing in on that sub thing, even maybe spinning it out into a secondary company, at least hiring ahead of e-commerce specifically for that. Sounds like they've already got fulfillment and all that shit figured out because they do so well and be like that right there could be your scalable little like thing to focus on. Keep doing the reselling business, right? That seems to work, but this could be the thing you could actually scale on your own side of things is this private label thing. Now, if that private label part of it did $1.5 million between Amazon and Shopify and it only did like 100K on Shopify and it didn't have any effort, then you're getting into something a little bit more tricky where it's like, hmm, you know, this might not be the best idea. Who knows? Thank you. I mean, that's a really intelligent response considering I've given you almost no details about this business. I mean, I think what you're saying is very interesting. So in this particular case, they didn't have an insanely large variety of products, but they had stuff in the homeware category and then some subsets. I kind of remember, and I, I wouldn't reveal client stuff anyway, but like lighting, you know, homeware, whatever clothing it wasn't that but it wasn't ridiculous it was not however highly unified so i guess if you were looking at that i'd imagine that you'd be looking at okay where's the opportunity which ones of these are selling better? i would i would and go then, and pull a report from their shopify store yeah yeah sort yeah, by best sellers for the last year and be like what's actually selling on this website and here's something that i found is i was on a shopify site a couple of years ago and the guy was trying to build his own brand, but he was still like doing some like third party reselling type situation stuff. And I went and looked and the number one product that was being sold by this website wasn't a private label product. It was like a third party product that they just had integrated in through kind of some, some fulfillment things. And I was just like, this is, and it was like a big majority. It was like 70% of your sales are this one product and it's not the private label stuff. 
So like, why do you want to invest in the private label stuff when this is the thing that's selling? And then it's, you know, uh, like we kind of talked about in the last episode, then it's time for like hard, like uh, make a, a hard truth about it. It's like, eh, maybe this isn't a good idea. Yeah, what, yeah, hard truth is interesting, isn't it? One thing that strikes me with that, the word strategy is, is well, for starters, it's overused for things that I think of as tactical and, and probably going to die in three months as well. we got a great strategy for getting a hack. I'm like, no, you haven't. That's just a hack. That's fine. Use it, but don't call it a strategy. But the real hard truth about the word strategy, in my opinion, is Porter, the guy who created some of the modern concepts around business strategy, like Porter's Five Forces of Strategy. He says very clearly in a book that I read, it's rather unreadable, can't remember the title, <laughs> But he says something like, it's all about trade-offs. In other words, you can be really great at this, which means you, by definition, you can be great at that. And I guess that that's some of what you're, you're talking about here, right? Some hard decisions. Like if this read selling is really, really working for you and your private label brand isn't, then you may make a decision, for example, to give up. Well, I mean, it's just brand. private labels, super hard. Finding product market fit is super yeah. hard. And that's why I have been running an agency for the last seven years and I haven't launched my own brand is because I haven't found something that I felt as passionate about as I wanted to invest that much time in and building. And and that's kind of the the truth is is the going from zero to one and finding that that initial traction with a customer is kind of the the magical moment in a business. And it's kind of like striking, you know, if, it, lightning striking. It, it's it's pretty rare, it's pretty difficult. And that's the the hard part about things is having a truly winning product offer. Yeah, I, I agree. And by the way, sometimes you can have that happen and kind of overlook it to a degree. I've got one client, it's very intriguing. So he's got a drop shipping site. And again, I'm going to reveal any details, but, and he's also in buried in the mix, got his own private label business product rather. And now we've done a review of the finances. The bad news is that the vast majority of his products don't make any profit at all with the way it's set it up. Okay. He hasn't got his own capital tied up in the drop shipping side. The bad news also is some of his private label products don't sell and he's got a, a room full of them at home. This is just normal. But the good news is that one of them selling really well and people are actually pestering and asking him for, you know, can I have this in a different color? And so I said to him, look, go back to those people and ask them. And it's one of the wonderful things you can do with Shopify that's just either not, not viable or very risky on Amazon, which is ask them for the money up front. And then if they'll pay, that's even more proof of product market fit, right? Not mm -hmm. only will they pay for the product, They'll pay and wait for the product. So again, once you find product market fit, like I said to him, like, let's double down on that because it's profitable. People want it and they really want it. And now we've got something. And again, that was an example of buy. It nearly got mixed, missed in the sort of yeah, no, that, products, right? That I think is a very fantastic idea. So that right there is like, that's exciting because if people are asking you for more products, people are fucking lazy. And if... The fact that a customer, more than one customer had asked that means there are more people out there that want it. So then what you'd want to do is you want to... Here's another powerful thing about having your own audience versus Amazon is you can email everyone that signed up for your email list that's bought that product before. Very specific questions. Be like, you know, would you buy this in this color? Or like, what color do you want? Do a survey. Then you find the new color that you're going to put out. You can do pre-orders through your own website and tell them up front, educate them that like this is going to go to production. You're going to get this product in three months, whatever. I don't know how long it takes. You can do all that stuff. But what you can also do, right? Now, this is more specific to him, is he's got these other private label products that aren't really selling, but they're kind of taking up kind of capacity into his inventory and building bundles on Amazon. I don't know how you do it, but on Shopify, you can do bundles in a lot of different ways. But like, Talking, going back to like building a winning offer, I would maybe bundle some of the ones that aren't selling as free gifts or, you know, buy both and save X just to get rid of that other inventory and get that liquid capital back. But just make, making a more appealing offer with bundling those kind of the winning product with something that's a little less winning, I guess, if it makes sense, right? Because no one's going to buy, you know, things that just aren't like no one wants like a toy car and a couch that really doesn't make any sense. But like if they're if they're close, you can do it. And the cool thing about like getting really into the AOV stuff and and uh, average order value motivation is it just comes down to upsells, cross sells, and bundles. And that's really specific to the type of product and the what does the customer want. We can go on for a long time about that stuff. Brilliant. But I like the thinking because yeah, bundles. By the way, you can do bundles on Amazon pretty straightforwardly in one sense, in the sense that you need to actually physically package them together in some form and have a separate barcode and a separate listing. Now they can be a variant under, you know, so parent child. So I don't know if that's slightly more flexible on Shopify, but as you say, I think the, 
that could be going down a rabbit hole there because the key thing is you earn the audience, you can email them. You, you can't really do that very easily on Amazon and you get, you can run a foul. So yeah, I, I love the thinking and bundling together stuff that doesn't work, however, with stuff that has sold is, is viable on Amazon or Shopify. I think it's just basically rather overlooked. People will just get desperate and try and sell them separately for 10 cents on the dollar. And I, I'm like, why do that? Favorite thing ever is the mystery gift for like five dollars oh, wow. as a as an upsell in cart. My friends are in a very successful band, and they get rid of their old tour merch for basically cost as a mystery add on. You pick your size, and you get a five dollar shirt if you bought another shirt, or and it hits the free shipping threshold, whatever. And that's just a fantastic way to get rid of dead stock. I like it. Mystery gift. In the right market, again, that could work really, really well. I like yeah, it. Yeah, and that's something Amazon will not let you do. Yeah. No, that that is very on Amazon. Yeah, the word mystery and Amazon don't go together. I mean, they like to keep us in the dark as third party sellers, you know, but yeah, you know, who your demographics are is a mystery to you, but like the consumers need to know everything. Now, I know you've got a nice little case study about your own clients, where one of you that I think you mentioned to me when we discussed this episode, about 70% of his business was on Amazon. And then they went over to direct consumer because they wanted the higher margin. So tell me a bit more about that as an example of a sort of. Well, I've got two examples for you. Oh, okay. So I th the first one I'm going to tell you is, is one that's a case study that's not on our website because it's the truth, right? This is what happens. We had a gentleman that was doing mid six figures on Amazon in a home goods category, specific product line and bundles. You know, it made sense on paper, right? And we had the conversations. He understood the investment involved in building, you know, a new website. And along with doing that, a little bit of education from us on training on like this is how this is just how Shopify works and like the systems that you should have, right? Here's here's a good MVP, right? That's it's kind of how we always approach anyone coming over from Amazon or a legacy brand coming over or startup. It's always like, let's just do with the MVP first, and then we can iterate upon this as we know that things are working. And so we spent all this time building this this business. And it wasn't getting sales. And we had told him it wouldn't get sales because where the hell is this traffic going to come from? It didn't click for some reason. And they didn't make the investment in hiring the appropriate people. Because again, all we do is build websites and make websites better. We don't do any of the marketing. So no customer acquisition, none of that stuff. So they didn't invest in you know doing any sort of influencer seating or any paid ads, anything like that. And it kind of just... They had a good looking website and that was it. And, you know, did I think that was a good investment for that client? No, not at the end of the day. Up front, I thought it was because I believed in the long tail of it. And I thought that they were going to make the investment in acquiring these customers and building out the secondary channel. But it just came down to the honest fact that they didn't have the capacity internally, you know, the ability to hire someone else or that they couldn't find someone trustworthy to kind of own that element of the business and really run with it and scale it. So it kind of just became an expensive brochure for them online, right? So that's the worst case scenario. Uh, you have any questions about that? Because that could no, be... No, I just wanted to say thank you for being honest and having a case study where something didn't work because nobody does that. And it's not because you weren't great at your job. If Yeah, they, what they asked us website, for, yeah. we, built them a cool, we built them a really cool website. It yeah. looked great. It was but, on. It was on in in their budget. It was on their timeline, and it mm. worked. Right, you could buy stuff on it. Yeah, we we didn't say we were guaranteeing sales because that's the thing people really need to know about this part of it. Is if you're gonna jump, you're not jumping ship. If you're gonna build out this thing on Shopify, you're starting from zero almost. The only thing that your advantage there is you've got a product already and you've got fulfillment figured out. You have no customers. You don't have an email list. You don't have who's driving traffic to your website. Oh, we're gonna, you know, and we're gonna have Google do that. Cool, but there's already fifteen hundred other brands in your category that have been working on Google for longer than you with their organic SEO, their content, etc. You have to understand building this own channel is a lot harder to acquire the amount of traffic that just comes with being on Amazon. Yeah, very interesting. And sorry to interrupt you. I was about to say you did a fantastic job, but and you clearly explained that the other half, maybe the harder half, frankly, although building a great website and not a casual thing, but getting traffic and traffic that converts, of course. And uh, you clearly outlined that and they did half the job and then left, which just seems easily done, but also kind of tragic because why bother building a website? And And I guess that 
you talked about the difference in mindset between somebody selling on a marketplace like Amazon, which is what I'm kind of in my blood now versus your own site. And I think the key is on Amazon, you've got to nail the product to market fit. You've got to have competitive pricing. So it's a harsh environment, but on the other hand, you only have to solve the product market fit only hard, but that's what you've got to solve and then getting the thing made and fulfilled. And that's hard enough, but that's it. And you don't even need to solve fulfillment if you use FBA, right? But the whole yep. traffic side is invisible to you because Amazon just takes care of that. And the conversion rates that you get there is absolutely crazy. Yes, you can optimize it. Um, I mean, yes, you can optimize Amazon conversion rates, but the, the basic starting point, 10%, 20% is just insanely good. So you make an exceptionally good point. So anyway, I guess I'm just underlying all the truth of what you're saying. Bad interview. Let's move on to the case. Second case study, probably more positive. Awesome. So this one is on our website. It doesn't talk as much about the Amazon underlyings of the business here, but I, I do know a bit more about this. So we had a brand come through and they, they made products in kind of like the children's educational space. I'm not going to use their brand name, but you can go find it on our website because because I want a reason for you to go visit our website. It's electricguy.io. Anyways, this is a business that 70% of their business was on Amazon, right? But the direct consumer part of their business, they were kind of nerdy and they would look at the information. The margins were greater, but from a kind of like overall business sense, they're like, we can't invest in this as much as like we know we could but we still want to invest in it. So what did that mean? They had their own existing website and we kept telling them from day one, like, this is garbage. Can we just redo this, please? And they didn't want to do that route, right? Which is, again, it's like sometimes the best option isn't the option that people can afford or, or, or you know, have the budget to do at that moment. And so we have to kind of do what we can, right? So they came in with kind of an underperforming website and they didn't have anyone on staff that really understood the direct consumer side of things. So they kind of brought us in with kind of the pandemic in their product line, this product kind of shot through the roof and they were like, all right, we do need to make this investment in, in the, in the, the Shopify store. Right. But they didn't want to do a brand new store. So it was kind of came in and it was more on our retainer side of offerings. We were doing iterative optimization. So what the heck does that mean? Right. We basically jumped in and did some strategy work with them, which is a, for lack of a better term, we did a bunch of diagnostics. So we looked at their front end user experience. And just from being in the game a lot, there's a lot of obvious stuff that sticks out to us like, this is weird. This doesn't make sense. This is just bad in general. Like you can't even click this button. So you, that's it produces a laundry list of problems. You've got the back end audit of their code base, right? And especially right now, it's kind of a hot commodity where there's a brand new style of building a theme for Shopify that's faster and more user friendly for the end customer but it is an investment to make the jump over to this new style of doing it. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity within how the code works, or you find a lot of opportunity within performance, which performance, how fast your website loads. Oh, here's something that has nothing to do with Amazon versus Shopify. You can't control your page speed on shop on Amazon, but on Shopify you can. And some people just dirtle it up with really bad large pictures or a million lines of JavaScript that are just ruining it. Um, the slower your website, the lower your conversion rate. The faster your website, the, the better your conversion rate. I'm not saying that. That is a proven fact by a million studies is the faster your website, the higher your conversion rate is going to be. There's obviously dim diminishing returns at some point. But anyways, that's a lot of what we do is when we're doing this code audit and performance audit, it's finding areas for improvement within that. And then we're also auditing kind of their app stack on the back end. Shopify is very focused on doing the... But like the website CMS part really, really well. And then if you want to get anything more advanced or a little more unique or custom, they opened up kind of the third party partnership ecosystem to be like, they will do that, like whatever you want. Like we're selling the product online. That's what we're good at. So we're usually auditing kind of those back end app steps to initially find like things to improve upon. So the first step of most CRO retainers is find the, the problems and then kind of sort them in like the way which is going to be more impactful you ever heard of the ice framework for sorting things to do so no, it's impact sure. confidence and ease so let's say we did an audit of, of, a, of a website of your clients and i'm like here's a dozen things that we just off the top of our head knows wrong without even getting into the more nerdy stuff which i'll get into in a second and so then you sort it by impact like what do we think this is going to do out of zero to ten confidence is like how confident are we in this kind of suggestion 
And then ease is like, how hard is it to do this, right? You should search for the ice strategy on Google and put a link in the show notes because it's really fun to help you prioritize what, what you should. And then you kind of just let the answer of this math equation sort what you should be doing, right? Now, sometimes clients want to do something for a specific reason or we want to do something for a specific reason. It kind of screws that up, but you throw everything into that and that's really fun. And that's just kind of the upfront work. And then there's the secondary stuff that takes a bit longer, right? So there's like the heuristic stuff and then there's the stuff that the data tells us. And then there's like heuristics and stuff we know. And there's the stuff that the data tells us. So that's diving into analytics and the back end and stuff like that. And then the third step of kind of CRO, and this is where nobody really does it, is what is the customer telling us? So now we're getting in, we're doing customer interviews, we're doing user testing, we're setting up like screen recording software to basically see where people are getting frustrated with using the website and asking customers straight up like, oh, what's broken? Like, why didn't you buy this thing? And all of that stuff, all those insights can really help kind of raise these KPIs that we're looking to work towards. Now, with this particular client, something we were really looking to do was raise their average order value up. And it was a home run for this one because... And now here's a free, here's free advice for everybody. Go buy your own product on your own website. And if you don't have an upsell in place anywhere, you're leaving money on the table, right? So for this particular one, we added some stuff into their cart to motivate upsell, you know, a lower valued item that worked well with the item that was already in their cart. It also helped with the progress bar on their cart to kind of motivate the purchase. Um, we also did a lot of work on the performance side of thing, which helped increase the conversion rate. And then we helped them set up and fix their subscription business, which led to a 44% increase in their return customer rate. So all in all, I never let the members get set at the beginning, but we increased their average order value by 25% during this engagement, their conversion rate by 11%. And then their return customer rate was something they were super stoked on, which was re returning subscription business was a big part of it. And you know what? To, to, to be completely honest, there was a lot of stuff we couldn't do that we were limited to to do with this engagement then I think we could have got even better results out of this one. Excellent. And thank you for, again, giving a realistic case study where, you know, 25% doesn't sound like a massive amount in some ways, if you're not thinking about it clearly, but if your cost of acquiring something is X and your AOV is Y and they're the same, if you increase your average order by value by 25%, you've, you've taken a breaking even business to pretty healthy profit. And that, yeah. that's a huge, huge thing. So I think that's, that's just to kind of try and give context to numbers. Sometimes percentages are funny things, aren't they? Sometimes people don't take them very seriously. Well, I'm, here's I'm the, ready enough to do the that. math. The math behind e-commerce comes down to three KPIs, right? It's average order value, conversion rate, and sessions. So this is on your own website on like a, a, a Shopify store. If you take your average order value and you multiply it by your conversion rate and you multiply it by your sessions for the last 30 days. So your average order value for the last 30 days, your conversion rate over the last 30 days, and then your sessions over the last 30 days, you're going to get something that's pretty dang close to what your sales were for the last 30 days, right? So now you just established your baseline. So you can go in and see what like a 20% lift would look like to any of those KPIs and how that would affect your overall kind of business. So the magic number is actually 23%. If you can increase each of those KPIs by 23%, you have doubled your business. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you're exactly my kind of nerd because for some reason I find that very exciting. And I, if your money is at stake, it's certainly a hell of a lot more exciting. I mean, for those of you who think that math is a, is a bit dull and you just want to put products out that look pretty and beautiful and create lovely influencer videos or whatever else you think is better, quotes unquote, those are wonderful marketing activities, but money in your pocket is a beautiful thing all day. Yeah, exactly. So we better cut to the, the bit where you obviously, you know, I, look, I can feel your passion for conversion rate optimization and, and I love it because that's what makes more money for people. And I love that kind of work with clients for the same kind of reason that you do, I think, which is like, the, there's the thrill of the chase. How can I find the information I need? How can I make it better? You see the numbers come out, but of course you're giving money back to the consumer or the customer, the client in this case, which is a beautiful thing. So a um, couple of things to, to point people to. First of all, you've got your honest e-commerce podcast. Yes. So honestecommerce.co, I believe is the place to go and check that out. Um, yep. Just tell us a tiny bit about what you do over there. Cool. Every week I interview an amazing founder and I'm basically trying to get the the founder's story in, in a sense of like, where'd the idea come from? I think a lot of entrepreneurs out there want to start a brand, but figuring out what to do and just how the ideation worked is always curious. So I always ask them like, where did this idea come from? And then I asked them kind of what did they do next? How to go from idea to you know, either testing, which is what you should do, everybody, to then, you know, finding this product market fit. And then kind of like, okay, what's next from there? You know, so there's a lot of our listeners are kind of in the scale from doing, you know, eight 
plus figures to just getting started, right? So I have kind of asked what the journey is about with all these founders. And then I also do bonus episodes every once in a while where I have subject matter experts on about things that are way smarter than me. So, you know, I'll have like other agency owners in the ecosystem on, I'll have consultants, freelancers, perhaps I'll have Michael on in the future talking about Amazon. And so those bonus episodes come out either once or twice a month as well. But yeah, you can hear me basically every week interviewing a brand founder and kind of basically trying to get them to tell us what they did and how it worked. So potentially any listener out there can kind of learn from that. Fantastic. And I'll just briefly mention a couple of other options. So if you're doing over a million pounds on Shopify or dollars or in Amazon Marketplace, so Twisted chases on for this, you get a free strategy call over at electriceye.io. That's the right URL, yeah? Yes, absolutely. Electriceye.io. Just jump jump over there and schedule a strategy call and say that you have heard, heard me from this particular show. And we'll jump on that first call and make sure everything makes sense. And we can get you guys set up with the diagnostic that I was talking about, which was the first part of the engagement that we did with the, the brand I was just speaking about. Or if you're thinking about making the jump from Amazon to building something on Shopify, I've got a lot of very specific kind of opinions about that, that I would share with you. I'd ask you a lot of questions. So feel free to reach about reach out about that as well. Fantastic. And yeah, if you haven't heard it yet, if you're on the fence about getting on a call with Chase or his team, then listen to the first episode. We talked about that very question, you know, marketplace versus direct to consumer or Amazon versus Shopify. I said a lot of, I'll said yeah. a lot of things that probably drove a lot of business away from us, but it's the truth. We want to make sure that people kind of, it's an investment. We understand that we want everyone to win. Absolutely right. And then finally, you've got your book on CRO, that's conversion rate optimization and the funnel or crash course at www.brandscalingframework.com, if that's correct. Yes. We, uh, we kind of glossed over that, but that book, the brand scaling framework is that is that math equation that I just talked about a few minutes ago. And it's a crash course into each of those KPIs and how to increase those KPIs. So it will definitely help you understand where to focus your time and energy. And I'll probably highlight some things where you know you might want to talk to an expert about it. Amazing. Yeah, that's great stuff. Listen, we packed in the value here. I'm going to have to dash off to another appointment. I've got to get you in need you to go and optimize the heck out of somebody's website. But just the final thing to say is Chase Climate from Electric Eye. Thank you so much for coming on. Really enjoyable episode. Absolutely, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. 